Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Skip Backus, I'm CEO here at Omega Institute. Um, very excited to have this call today with uh, Thomas Hubel. Um, I've noticed from the chat, we have people from all over the world and all over the United States. And it's the one thing that I really love about these calls is the, the reach is just so incredible. And um, so to, to have all of your participation, uh, thank you, it's an uh, exciting time. I've known Thomas a couple of years. Uh, the first time I met him was uh, back in um, 2018 uh, when the brought the uh, Celebrate Life Festival to the Omega campus. Um, Thomas is a, a spiritual teacher, speaker, author, and founder of the Academy of Inner Science. Um, his work explores uh, the quest for greater awareness, and his teachings combine uh, somatic awareness practices, advanced meditation practices, and trans formational processes uh, in working on both individual and collective trauma. He is the co-founder of the nonprofit, The Pocket Project, aims to increase awareness and understanding of collective trauma and reduce its impact. Um, so, welcome, Thomas, hello. Hello, Skip. Hi, welcome um, everybody. Yeah, so Thomas, uh, can we start with first, how are you, where are you, and um, how is it with the virus there? Well, how I am, I'm good. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have this conversation with everyone here and with you. Where am I? Where I am? I'm in um, Tel Aviv, Israel. That's where I live at the moment. And that's where I'm also locked down in a way. So there's no in and out of Israel at the moment. So we are, my life pretty much changed from traveling a lot mm. to uh, being at home. So, which has a very beautiful sites as well, of course. It needed a lot of logistic changes, and uh, but it's also a lovely time, more time with my family here, my daughter, my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, and since we are using this technology here, uh, I think we we have also a great way of connecting with each other. And, mm -hmm. and I think we learned pretty well how to create closeness also virtually. And with the virus, it's... Um, I think Israel pretty early, like you, in this way, uh, you see a country that uh, is used to kind of catastrophes and war situations and um, and the kind of um, very strong leadership that comes in in a crisis, closes everything down. That, and that prevented actually that the, that the virus outbreak became mm -hmm. big. So it's pretty contained here. Um, but also with strong regulations, uh, but I think health-wise, it, it didn't create such a catastrophe. So that's, yeah. a, good, that's a good side. Yeah, well, we're right at the uh, very beginning of reopening here uh, in New York, in the uh, Hudson Valley. Um, and it's funny, you know, as always, I tend to prepare for, for calls and for presentations that I do. and. It seems to always happen that um, something throws me uh, just before the call uh, and everything changes in what I was gonna talk about. So I wanna just share a little bit. I, I, because we were opening up here, I stopped at the grocery store on the way in and I was approaching the door and there's a big sign on the door that says you can't enter the store without having a mask on. And there's a guy standing there swearing at the sign and doesn't have a mask and he's, you know, just walks away in utter disgust and. Then I walk into the store and the shelves are all full. There's toilet paper and bleach and everything that's you know been supposedly out of uh, stock for a long time. And um, just the abundance of what's in the store and having remembered just the night before, hearing the stories about uh, the Navajo Nation and what they're dealing with just in access to water and electricity and so forth and feeling just you know, the disconnect between, you know, such a, an abundance in one place and such a struggle in the other place. And then also having, you know, people literally turn around and walk away from me as I'm in the aisle and, you know, feeling a disconnect to other people in the store. Finally, the plastic barrier at checkout, you know, sort of did it for me in terms of just the difference that I feel in my life right now between 
having to hold so much in terms of you know disconnect to people which i understand that it creates a safety the the, the distance and the masks and so forth and i understand the the stress that's felt there but the closeness that comes from the opportunity that i've had with my family that now we're all living together and my grandchildren are with me and it's just been an absolute pleasure but i feel like i'm living in two worlds so um how do you how do you deal with that do you have any suggestions on how we hold both you know that both of those experiences at the same time yes i i think that that brings us right into the i think the main conversation how on the one hand we need an internal practice of presence like we need some kind of inner tools how to to practice mm -hmm. presence in our lives and what is presence presence is in a way a, a function of inner coherence. And what is inner coherence? Inner coherence means that my nervous system, that includes my body awareness, my emotional awareness, my, my thought process, my cognitive capacities, and my inside outside awareness, like how I can relate to you, feel you while I feel myself. Mm. And so that's the good part. I mean, that's the, the easy part is when all of this works, then we, we will call it, we have a good moment. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in triggering moments, when we go through like stressful situations, when anyway, the whole society is in a stressful moment, and then we have small moments happening in a shop or somewhere else. So that inner coherence gets uh, kind of challenged. And, and, there is a reason why, like, I'm very passionate about mystical teachings, spiritual teachings, and the, mm -hmm. the spiritual practice and the awakening process. But I came to see through my teaching work how important it is that we learn more and we can learn how to take care of individual and collective trauma, because that's what actually creates the sand in the engine. It's not our good moments when we understand each other and we have enough space to contain our intimate partners when they're stressed, or our children, or co-workers, or mm -hmm. people at the supermarket, or politicians. But like the interesting part is when we start repeating the disconnect or the separateness that we carry inside ourselves through the traumatization that we experienced ourselves, and that maybe our parents experienced, our grandparents, and then the the current pandemic actually i think the crisis doesn't actually happen in what's happening it's very challenging for some people health wise it's very challenging for some people economically but what it triggers in us is actually touches a lot of our past it touches a lot of mm -hmm. of the stored stuff that we carry uh, uh around and and i think that's why we need a culture that is informed and has lots of skills how to take care of those triggered moments in a different way because otherwise we just repeat traumatizations mm. and we, we see this between parents and and uh, children but we also see this in in more tough crisis situations and i think the pandemic is just one of coming situations global situations also climate change is is gonna bring us more and more uh, crisis moments around the world. And I think we really need a practice and we need a resilience training as mm -hmm. society, how to deal with that. So yeah, that's a little bit. Yeah. Well, what thank, I you. Think. thank you for that. Um, you know, so many, uh, and I understand why so many people are, you know, anxious to get back to normal, you know, uh, people want to get back to work. They, they want to have uh, their regular, their, general experiences in life and not be dealing with so much of the, the stress and, and strain of this. But part of it for me also, and, and I'm you know, sitting in a place of somewhat privilege to be able to even have these thoughts, but somewhat for me is uh, about, I don't, so I don't want to go back to normal. I want to be able to take advantage of this sort of break that has happened to really be able to look at as you were starting to speak to what's sort of the the underlying tensions that are there that um, actually exacerbate what we're feeling in our in our every day and um, part of it for me is really wanting everybody to uh, 
be involved in this, to experience this. And so I know sometimes you, you talk about um, consumer versus participant. Um, and can you speak a little bit about um, how you think about that? Yeah, first of all, you said something that's important that maybe applies to many of us here, is if I have the privilege in my life to have enough time for consciousness development and retreats. And mm -hmm. so it means that, that there is a lot in place in my life that I, in a way, have a privilege. And the privilege, I believe, comes with responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the ability to respond is that for some people, the current crisis, back to normal means to, to keep my job that I need in order to have food every day. So it's very understandable that somebody that is very dependent on the monthly income really needs to get back to normal, because if not, then there is a much more severe consequence to it than for others, where we have more space and time to really be in a kind of a reflective mode and, and look also, what, what does the crisis, this crisis show us? And, and what's the, reflect, like the, the reflection and the capacity to reflect on maybe social pathologies, individual and collective um, absences that co-create this current moment mm -hmm. and what actually led up to it and mm -hmm. what, what can we learn for further crisis moments. And so what I, what I often say is that, the, that every one of us, I can, I can either consume, consume a movie or I can be a participant in the movie that I'm watching. I can consume a, a podcast or I, I am a participant or a concert. I, I know you love Bruce Springsteen concerts. Like you can either be a consumer. So say, okay, I'm consuming the music or you are actively engaged. And every time we are actively engaged, we actually channel energy into the current context. Mm. So a participant in, in society, in our family systems, in whatever, in our kid's life, to be a participant in our kid's life or to be a participant in the political uh, arena means that I am a citizen that understands interdependence. And it means that participation is a coherence building tool. Whereas consumption takes more energy out. So I'm going to listen what Skip has to say. <laughs> you know, I will find out. So tell me something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm a cons I can consume what you have to say, or I am create also when I watch a movie, I can be creatively a participant and participating in a movie, even if I just watch it, it seems. Mm -hmm. But while I do it, I add energy. Or when I listen to a podcast that has been recorded three years ago and I listen to it, I actually send energy through participation back to the one who recorded it. And not because I send energy. No, because participation is a co-creative process. And I think mature citizenship is because consumerism comes with entitlement. Suddenly I'm entitled to have all kinds of things. If I'm a participant, I'm also asked to create it. At the moment, there are many people that criticize uh, the political landscape, and, uh, and I'm sure that there's many things that could be done better in many places around the world. On the other hand, many of the people that criticize that, are they, they were never in the position to do that. Mm. So I think that to be a, a creative participant needs maturity, emotional maturity, and I, I, I think we see right now in the culture all kinds of responses that mark different levels of maturity or regression, which mm -hmm. I think in itself is natural. That's what we experience as human beings. It's just important that we are aware what kind of responses in the leadership and in the society actually are regressive responses. And once they are regressive, they only have a past. They don't have a future. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in a regressive moment with my wife, I might say things and do things that does, they don't bring anything new. That's why we have similar conversations in intimate relationships that are mm -hmm. that don't bring in some new changes. And I think 
that's participation has a, has a future. Like I'm open to my higher potential. Mm -hmm. When we say in the spiritual work, we say light, the nature of light in embodied light is, is awareness of myself, of you, of the world. So that's embodied light. Potential light, that's the consciousness that is above our ceiling. That's our kind of, that's the, what I would call the future is, is comes in, in, in the forms of insight, of revelations, of creative moments and dialogue. So mm -hmm. that after this conversation, both of us walk away and we feel inspired means that some drops of light came through and we, we feel inspired. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that future is actually needed that we create something new. So not going back to the old world, but we want to add something to the world that is new. That's our learning. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I believe whenever we do trauma, what is trauma work? Trauma work is just to integrate what we couldn't experience. And integration always comes with understanding. Mm -hmm. And and the lack of integration comes with patterns. And we see many patterns, also big patterns, like the wars or, you know, we say, oh, we learn so much from the Holocaust and there won't be any concentration camps anymore. They are happening right now as we speak. There are concentration camps here on this planet. So it's not only when we integrate the massive wounds of our past, there is real learning. If not, then maybe we have cognitive understanding, but we don't have yet a real embodied transformation. And I think that's the job of everybody that has the means and the possibility, uh, like many of us here do, yeah. to really ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, since you mentioned uh, Bruce Springsteen, I, I've always gone back and thought about what is it about those concerts that is uh, so intoxicating in a way that keeps drawing me back concert after concert, year after year, beside the fact that I'm from New Jersey. And um, so <laughs> it is the sense of being one with 50,000 people is, is being, mm. being that, that in, in that space and time, I am part of something whole. I am part of an experience shared. And uh, so as I look at the work in front of us, um, you know, there's the, deep, the work of our, our own personal work that has been shown to us during this time. And as we say, what's been made transparent in the culture, it seems like the more that we can walk in that space of, of what I would call we, um, the, the, greater the chances for us to really over time deal with some of the um, collective trauma and, and be able to build a future that is more representative of that, that lightened experience of oneness. Um, is, is there something that you see that is a practice or a sort of a, a way to step out of, step out of that space that, that we all know when it's happening to us as we step into the, the, the spaces and the experiences that are, are so um, conflicted in that? What is the practice? How, how do we manage to broaden our experience of that uh, sense of, of we? Yeah, I uh, um, I collected the my findings in the last eighteen years uh, about collective trauma and what I have seen in many 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 groups uh, that we run. And and here are a few insights. And I also like my books coming out in November, and there is a whole collection of those insights. And there are just a few. Um, one is that we have been born into a world. So when we came in, we came in to a world that is already fragmented. Hmm. So somebody took a stone and threw it into the window and the window has cracks. So my nervous system learned from people that carried fragmentation inside. It's like a window with cracks. So my mother had it to a certain degree, my father, my grandparents after the Second World War and uh, teachers, mm -hmm. society. So many of us have been educated 
by a world that is partly conscious and integrated and partly not. The part that is not integrated, since I don't know how the world looks like when it's not traumatized, is I might call this normal. Mm. And so, and then I found out what are actually, uh, for example, a split between the physical, emotional, and mental expression of a person. We might say, yeah, many people have it. That I can think something, the fact that I can write a PhD about childhood attachment or childhood trauma and be very traumatized myself. It looks like normal. Yeah, I can go to university, study something, but that knowledge doesn't heal my own trauma yet. I need to go maybe to five or 10 years of therapy. If I don't do it, I can be an expert on childhood trauma, but be very traumatized myself. So we might think, okay, that's normal. Or we might say, no, that's not normal. The fact that our minds operate often detached from nature to a certain degree seems normal. That's why many people have the feeling I'm separate and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like a particle on the planet. Mm -hmm. Whereas my body is the planet. Mm -hmm. So my body is not separate a separate, I am the game board too. It's not when you know when you play a game and you you move around on the game board. Yeah. It doesn't change the game board. But a human experience, neuroplasticity, and the wiring in our nervous systems and bodies and genetics and epigenetics, that is the game board too. That's the planet too. So we are life. But often trauma suggests that we are separate. Mm -hmm. So separation became one of the main rules of this game and is and many spiritual traditions actually say yeah but unification is the transcendence of separation into unity and that's why i think the first thing is that when when i hear for example about a shooting in a school mm. In order, so I can read this on my way to my next uh, event or to my next, oh, wow, there's a, like, but when I read that piece of news, the time that I would need to really understand what I read mm. is much more than I usually have. <laughs> because in order to feel the extent of what that event means, for the people involved, for the parents involved, for the teachers involved, for the society involved, for like, there's so, there's so much to one event, there's so much trauma and there's so many reverberations that I hardly can be a witness to that. So maybe we read the news and we understand what we read, of course, mentally, but in order to follow that emotionally and physically, to let that land in my body that I become a compassionate embodied witness is most of the time way too much. And I believe for many of us, the, the amount of information we consume doesn't correlate with the amount of information we can ground. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of discrepancy between the mental knowledge and the embodied knowledge. And, and the discrepancy is the amount of trauma in our culture. And so when we, when we uh, have a crisis that's amplified, the fragmentations in the culture, the polarization mm. and all the stuff will just be amplified. And, and that's why I think we need, we need, like I'm speaking recently about at least three main practices that we can all do. One is to, to practice every day practices that help our self-regulation that we practice, for example, when I speak to you now, then I feel you, like you are not just an image on my screen, I'm connected to your body, I feel your body, I feel you emotionally, I'm with you mentally, I'm relationally attuned to you, so that we, we feel together. It creates a kind of an intimacy in the virtual space. So there's co-regulation, when you tell me about what's difficult for you or vice versa, and we listen to each other really, so we, reg we help to regulate each other. And then, and that's what I think what you're also doing with all the calls and I mean, what we're all working on is to create intelligent, coherent networks, group spaces, like all of us listening now, the fact that we feel each other 
And the fact that we have an awareness that we are sitting all around the world and everybody listening now is part of a coherent field, that has an effect on every one of us. Mm -hmm. Group presence, and we all know this, when you go to the Bruce Springsteen concert, you know what it means, group coherence. Yes. And especially if you have musicians that are more conscious and more aware already, so it amplifies the effect that music has, and it becomes a consciousness event. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we need to take care, I believe, that we have in our lives more of those communities that are kind of aware of group presence, practice group presence, and when one of us goes through a difficulty and we, we uh, let's say you go through something and you speak and, and all of us are listening to you, in our awareness, everybody who's looking now has a, a skip and a Thomas inside, <laughs> inside our brains. Yeah. Perceptions, when I see you, I don't see you, I see you in me. You know, you are in my perception. You're, you're mm -hmm. happening in my brain. It doesn't get any closer than that. So when we really watch each other and feel each other, we, there, are, there are hundreds or most probably more than thousand uh, skips now. That's a scary... So there's one... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or there is you, the yeah. particle... And in everybody who sees you now, you're a wave. You're a particle and you're a wave. Consciousness, like when everybody is present with us, it has an effect on us and we have an effect onto everybody. So there is a coherence loop. And that coherence loop is, a, I saw this, I saw healing moments in groups where I spoke, I worked with somebody in front of hundreds of people and you could, it was so quiet that you, that everybody was there mm -hmm. and dialed in. And that has a tremendous healing power. So the more of, the more communities we have like this, not only do we accelerate the, the healing in the world, we also create resilience. Yeah. And, and I think, Self, co, and group regulation are three fundamental forces that I believe we can create in many places. It's not so hard to do, and it's tremendously powerful. Yes, yes. So it, it's interesting. We've all set uh, at the beginning of this the intention to be here today together. Um, and I, I really liked when you were talking about uh, time and space in a way, because I think we are... Uh, so bombarded constantly um, that it's hard to be able to have the time and space to do a, a real connected and deep process and really be present and, and feel. And I think if there was one thing that um, I would like to try in, in my own life is to create more of that space to be able to feel more of that. Um, so uh, with that, um, I, I know um, we're going to move to questions in a little while, and I just want to do a little bit of instruction with that. So if you're on um, the uh, Facebook, uh, go to the comment section. If you're on Zoom, uh, use the chat, and uh, we'll be uh, you know, looking through those questions in a little bit. Uh, but uh, going back to allowing time and space, uh, Thomas, do you think you could do a little practice with us um, just to um, sort of ground us in this time uh, that we've uh, all come to share together in our intention? I will be delighted. Yeah, of course. Uh, I love it. And, and just a few words before we do that uh, on space. You know, even if like the, for many Postmodern people, the Bible is something we think we left behind. But um, there, is, there is a meaning to that God created or creates the world in six days, and the seventh day, the world, like God rests. Yeah. What does this do so in Israel, where I am now? Every, every Friday evening, the whole country switches consciousness from six days of creation to one day of Shabbat, 
But what does this mean? It means that Shabbat is consciousness. Shabbat is space. Hmm. And, and every, imagine every six days, everybody who is observant, and I'm not, it's not about uh, Judaism in, in specific, specifically, but it's everybody who keeps this, the practice is no matter what's happening, Shabbat is Shabbat. Mm. That's what it means. And this means that when we are on the sixth day, this is the sixth day. It's not that it happened and now we are on the game board. Like this is the day where through all of us, the world and the human being is being created. Mm. That's what it actually means more precisely. So we are all part of that creation. We all have a creative spark inside to mm. create the world together. So we are building the house of humanity together. Through trauma, we are often building houses that are like this. So we live in the house like that. And then we say, but why do you have such a back pain? Yeah. Thomas, maybe you should change in a way your body. Yeah, but my house is like this, say, or my company is like this, or my family says, right, but no, there's, I'm not surprised that you have neck pain. And so we create also systems and structures that are kind of distorted through unconscious trauma layers. Mm. But coming back to the space, the space and meditation and morning meditation every day, even if it's just 20, 30 minutes, to create space for just listening. And that's what we can do now, is mm. to create a space to tune in first with our bodies, to get grounded, and then to sit a few moments just with space equals listening and presence equals seeing. Presence is seeing. So when I'm not fully present, I also don't fully see the see life, but... When I, for example, we can take a breath now, a deeper breath, and when we exhale, I can slow down my exhalation and drop into my body. And then I exhale again and drop even deeper into my body. And, and I connect to the areas that are alive in my body where I can feel myself well, where I can feel my body well. There's dreaming sensations, aliveness. There is pulsation maybe, flow. And then I anchor myself more and more in the live parts of my body, which are my resources. If I do this every day, I create a fast track into the resource parts of my body. And then I can slowly embrace the parts of my body where I feel more stress or tension, tightness or absence. Now I feel that my cup is, is like a vessel. And in that, in that, my body is like a vessel. And in that vessel or cup, my emotions are happening. So I can check in with my current emotional state. If I can name present emotion, or maybe I feel that I'm, I can't, I don't feel myself emotionally, which is equally good. I can feel for a moment my mind. Is my mind active, relaxed, tight or tense, open, spacious?
And then I, I check in, what is actually aware of me perceiving all of that? What's the awareness? Which part of me is aware of feeling my body, feeling my emotions, my mind? And we're listening to the awareness itself. And for many people, this starts with a, a sense of inner space, a sense of inner seeing. sense of expansion and various levels of stillness, sometimes even timelessness. in that stillness kind of our touch on being like I'm here and also the stillness is not only still but deeply intelligent like dropping into stillness it's communicating also with a wider intelligence. And then gently we can take again uh, one or two deeper breaths and feel our feet on the ground or sitting on a chair. And gently come back with the open eyes and as we open our eyes to see if we can stay connected to that inner sense of stillness. Sometimes when we open our eyes, we pop back into a different mode and maybe we can, can open my eyes and kind of keep that inner sense of presence as I'm looking. Mm. Well, that was, you know, wonderful. It's amazing um, how practice can change you, you, you know, you, the, the experience in the, in the moment that you're having. And I feel like I'm sitting so much further back or in my chair. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. I, you it's know, I, as a, a long, long time meditator, I, I, I you know, the, the moments, the clarity that comes is just so profound to, to be able to sit deeply in, see, in, 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 in your seat. Um, and so thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I think what we'll do now is we'll, I'll move to some of the, the questions that are being sent in to me. And um, let's start with uh, Robin. 
who asks, uh, slowing down can be very challenging to those used to the chaos of trauma. Suggesting these folks just do it can backfire. What do you recommend to help those used to that crooked posture and mental emotional chaos um, as a place uh, to start and feel safe? Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's already been said through the statement or the question that like that inner chaos is a significant um, lack of safety. And, and before we talked about like self-regulation, this means that my nervous system can modulate freely between states of activation and states of relaxation. So I can work a lot, I can work 16 hours a day, then come home and just relax and be at home, go to sleep, whatever. In a nervous system that cannot do that freely because of some deep attachment stress or other traumatic events that happen. So our nervous system is on a, in a constant higher chronic stress level. And that becomes often so normal that we don't know. For some people we know because we are too fast and too agitated very often. But it's pretty important to see that most of the like the traumatizations, especially in early childhood, have a severe lack often of safety. And so in order to develop self-regulation, I need co-regulation. I need my parents to help me to learn to regulate myself. And if I didn't have that, then often uh, slowing down alone just amplifies inner states of fear and agitation. And what we need then is we need people to connect to people around that just a meaningful conversation. And of course, often uh, like professional people that know how to do that professionally, that for some time we need to substitute that co-regulation so that my nervous system can learn to regulate itself. And then once that's strengthened enough, because there's enough safety, then I can, I can practice more on my own. So it's true for some people, self-regulation practices are great and slowing down. And for some people, it, it brings up a lot of anxiety. And if I feel that that's too much for me, it's very important to reach out, either to bring in some help or to, to reach out also to friends, to, to talk to people, but not to be alone. And often, when I, when I suffered some traumatization in my life, my tendency is to do things alone. And I often say maturity doesn't mean suffering alone. But when I'm traumatized, I have more of a tendency to try to figure this out alone. And so reaching out is very important because that ultimately creates a sense of belonging, embeddedness, safety. Mm. Yeah. Another question coming in is uh, around coherence. And if you could speak a little more about uh, the concept of coherence and is there a simple way for each of us to discern what groups to participate in when seeking coherence? So first of all, there's a difference between coherence and harmony. Mm -hmm. Coherence might feel often like an inner flow, but it's not harmony. Coherence, we can be coherent in situations that are maybe more conflicted. Uh, so the stronger is the inner coherence, it's the resource that can integrate fragmentation. And coherence is, is a unification within different parts of my nervous system, which means also different parts of my experience. As I said before, my, my cognitive and rational capacity, my emotional self, my embodiment. Mm -hmm. And, and I think for us, I mean, maybe for, for people here on this call, it's, we are most of the time more used to practice and we are also more used to the fact that through our practice we find out how high is the degree of disembodiment hmm. because in the moment i see that i i need to ground myself i need to also ask the question not only that i need practices to ground myself i need to ask the question why am i why do i need that practice because not being grounded is an effort. Mm -hmm. So there's something happening in me that I'm not aware of how I pull myself out of my body. 
And for children that went through a lot of uh, chaos or neglect or trauma in the family, so it's much better to be out of the body because then it's less painful. Mm. And so when we experienced more often overwhelm, so we, we leave certain parts of our body. I often compare this, uh, like some people have heard me say that already, but um, that like the first time I came to Kathmandu, there is in, in Kathmandu at night, I was on the plane and then I see the city and there were p dark parts in the city. And I thought, it's interesting that the, I can't tell from the plane perspective if that's a part of the city that has a power cut because they turn off the electricity in different quarters, or if that's a lake, a mountain, a forest. And then I thought, wow, that's genius. That's, the, that's a great explanation for the human unconscious that parts in my body and my brain get down-regulated, the sensitivity is being pulled out, and the subject, me or you or anybody, we cannot tell what's happening in those parts. We become absent. Mm -hmm. And the nature of absence is that I don't know that I'm absent. I just experience my absence through relationship conflicts, through work conflicts, through difficulties in society. So. Coherence means to also integrate the absent parts of myself into a, an internal flow experience. That's why I said before, connect in your body to the parts that are alive. Mm -hmm. Where my nervous system is open, there is a sense of coherence. And once I'm more connected to my open resource parts in my body, I can expand my awareness into the less resource parts or the more unconscious parts in my body and turn on the light slowly also with the help maybe of other people. And um, so coherence is not harmony, but is, is an inner flow experience of presence that gives me resilience to be with more conflicted or difficult situation in a much more relational way. Because for me, resilience means that I can stay related to a difficult situation. Because often when, so when we call the situation difficult, then it's, we, we pull out. So my wife or my husband says something, boom, and I feel distant. Once I feel distant, I'm not anymore in an inner state of coherence. I'm already, I left the relation to a certain extent. And resilience or coherence is a function when something triggers me to include the trigger and still stay related to you. And I'm not talking about criminal situations. I'm talking about daily life situations ah, and triggers, yeah. not life-threatening situations, that I can uh, still respond versus react. And coherence is kind of this inner state of flow and presence that enables me to do this in more and more situations in my life. Yeah. It's interesting, the, the word resilience, and that it's a word that's used a lot in the climate movement. Um, and when we look at, for instance, the stewardship work we're doing with the 300 acres here at Omega, building resilience in our in our in the way that we are here, is a is a critical piece of the puzzle, um, and and I think it very much ties into the way that um, you were just expressing that word. Um, I have a another question from uh, Rachel and Carolyn um, to clarify the three practices to help collective healing. What are they? <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I think, like, at least in my understanding so far, I think collective trauma is something we, we start to explore. Um, and we are learning by doing. Uh, and what I understood so far, collective trauma is pretty complex. And so the three practices would be that I have I commit to an internal practice that is coherence or presence building. Then I start with the innermost circle of intimacy, which is my own trauma history. Before I connect to the collective trauma that I clarify my internal personal process more, because otherwise I tend to project my own trauma onto the collective or I get entangled in because I cannot discern what is actually collective trauma and what is individual trauma. So I need to be presence-based 
very important is also like a community of exploration that I don't do it alone. And then that I have a certain um, kind of work done in myself first. And then, and then one way we can practice collective trauma healing is first through our ancestral trauma. So if something happened in the generation of my grandmother or my great grandmother, and it has been passed on to me today, I can, for example, write uh, a narrative, like I write something about starting with my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. And especially I, I see this also the one, like there are, there are various collective traumas, for example, in the US, but one is immigration that the roots of our ancestors are not fully, often not fully deeply grounded uh, in the States. So they, they come from all over. And I think it's important to reconnect consciously to where the roots come from. Because immigration is actually for many people much more stress and was in the family system much more stress than we consciously deal with it and so when 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 that's my background or in europe the displacement and refugees and uh that's like when when people needed to kind of run away from very difficult circumstances i think that needs a lot of attention in order to integrate that well and to land somewhere really well if not we see after effects in the generations so to see what's actually my narrative and that narrative can be a mental emotional and physical narrative so while i write about my grandmother i pay closely attention to my emotions and to my body and notice that as well it's not just a mental uh, exploration it's not enough to know how my family tree looks like it's what happens in my body because as Bessel van der Kolk writes, uh, mm -hmm. I think very wisely, is that the body keeps the score, mm -hmm. which means we do the trauma healing through the body. Yeah. You know, that it, we need our body for the transformation. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask you, if you can, for a minute, um, talk to uh, the collective trauma of race in this country. We've just uh, had two particular episodes that are disturbing and and I wonder if you could just speak to us a little bit about how we might hold and deal with the the, the deep collective trauma around race yeah yeah that's that's very important um, as far as I see it and that's also one of the next steps that I I wanted to do um, in collaboration with maybe uh, different organizations in the States to start like a program on integrating, like looking at the collective trauma of race and, and doing some collective trauma work specifically for that. And I think, and maybe we can also talk about this, uh, the two of us, if like how we um, can create environments, because I think we need environments for it. We need we spaces with a certain skill set and this a certain um, composition where we can go step by step by step very precisely and and also slowly enough that we can surface what actually the trauma the race trauma is when we include all the unconscious aspects of it not only the symptoms that we see in the society but that we take the symptoms, for example, incidents that happened recently, and, and then we deepen our awareness into the experience in our bodies, emotions, minds, relations, and we go step by step. And the reason why I'm saying it is my understanding, the fact that so much of the collective trauma existed before we were born mm -hmm. means when I look where I want to go, how my imagination of how the society will look like once it's healed. I, I can imagine that's where I want to go. 
But I think that's not how it works because there's too much unseen stuff between us as we are talking here. We are sitting here, I don't know how many people, and in between us, invisibly, sits the race trauma. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at where I want to go, I constantly fall over the stuff that I don't see. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get to the great society, but there's a lot of information unseen that we need to surface in order to go together somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that needs a lot of facilitation skill. And if not, then we end up in, in similar patterns and then it's not really helpful. Then we say, okay, we, we did it, it was difficult, and we, you know, we had some achievements. Mm -hmm. But I think there's another way that we just come together. And I often saw this also in, in, in large groups when we worked on the Holocaust or on other collective traumatizations, that the group become group coherence becomes like the surface of a lake. So group coherence is like a magic pond. Mm -hmm. And when we, in, when we have enough coherence in a room, everybody feels safe enough, safe enough, I don't say safe, safe enough that our nervous systems can release enough information that appears on the surface of the lake. Mm -hmm. So the relational coherence becomes the water that displays, like a magician that displays the layers and layers of collective trauma. Like when it's, it's a bit similar to when you have a group of therapists and you have a client and we discuss uh, the process of a participant in a group in a team meeting. So the team becomes in a way the surface that surfaces information about that client, even if the client's not in the room. And so when we, when we say, okay, we come together with the intention to deepen our uh, embodied understanding of uh, race trauma. And then we go step by step by step by step and we open layers of information together, integrate them, and then see what's the expansion. And I think we need a, a very precise process for it and not to imagine too much where we wanna go, but to go really with awareness. Like the Tao Te Ching has a beautiful line, it says, a journey of a thousand miles starts from beneath your feet. Mm. <laughs> and, and I think that's a lovely sentence because often we look where we want to go and it's right. good that we know where we want to go. We want to heal like part of that uh, trauma, but how we go there yeah, yeah. is not clear because a lot is unseen. Yeah. Well, many times yeah. this culture wants to go from point A to point B and what's not realized is there is no A to B. And uh, there's That's basically right. a process between A to B and where, however it goes is where it goes. And it is so critical to the culture to be able to step into that conversation in a way that is um, deeply and skillfully facilitated because it is, mm. it is very easy to wind up caught along the way and also in That's a place right. that is not a real outcome. Um, and so um, I look forward to having that conversation with you in the future. Um, and yeah, so, I would love that too. Yeah, so we're, we're basically, um, we've uh, completed our hour here. And um, <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. thank you. And um, uh, I know we didn't get to nearly any of the hundreds of, of questions and, uh, on, that were sent to us. And I want to thank everybody participating online and uh, this of course will be available uh, for people on demand on uh, both of our websites and um, I just really I have the, uh, the deepest respect for the way that you can speak to such critical issue uh, so so thank you for this time Thomas and I, I look forward to our next talk yeah and thank you for our collaboration I really appreciate it thank you and thank you everybody for holding a space for yeah. us yeah uh, thank you all Thank you.